Welcome back, everyone. Our next speaker is Stephen Preston from the University of Brooklyn in New York, and he's going to talk about solar models and breakdown for the Muka Massa Holm equation. Please. Thank you. Um, so thanks very much to Francesco and Barbara for inviting me, and I will practice keeping my head on. Um, so there is no diffeology in uh, in this talk. It's um, so I'm, I, I know it's been you know, a lot of uh, very high dimensional stuff, but since the title of the conference is finite dimensional and infinite dimensional, I'm going to go pretty low level finite dimensional in, in a lot of this talk. Um, some of you may have heard this, uh, at least part of this talk before, um, and so I gave a version of this before I actually proved the theorem. Now I've proved the theorem, um, so that's just up as of a couple weeks ago in the archive. Uh, so let's start with something pretty easy, um, a central force system. The easiest possible one, so harmonic oscillator in the plane. Here's why. And all particles experience a force of constant magnitude that pulls them towards the origin. Um, now in general, this, this will be some function, maybe depending on t, maybe depending on x and y. Um, and in the case I really care about, depends on all sorts of strange things and other particles as well. But we're going to start off simple. Um, so what happens here? So I can write down the solution very explicitly. So x of t x of zero cosine kt plus x dot of zero over k sine kt. And of course, same formula for y. Uh, and what happens? So um, by eliminating t in these equations, you can very easily see, uh, and you probably know already, that uh, solutions move in some ellipse, which is centered on centered on the origin. So maybe something like that depending on the initial condition, maybe something like this. Uh, and once in a while, it will collapse. That ellipse will collapse onto a line. Um, so the question is, so it's the same for y. Uh, when can the particle reach the origin? Uh, and it's easy to calculate based on the explicit formula or based on the general principle. Um, as long as the angular momentum is not zero, it will go around the origin, reach some minimum distance, and then go back away. And of course, you know the same thing for uh, objects moving around the sun, which is where the name solar model comes from. It's the first thing I had in mind. If you're a planet moving around, even with a much stronger force, planet moving around the sun will not go into the sun or even a comet that's on some hyperbolic uh, trajectory or some other celestial object on a hyperbolic trajectory will not go into the sun unless it's aiming directly for the sun and dives into it. All right, so the, the reason this happens is because of conservation of angular momentum, which of course comes from this magical computation cancellation of the cross term in the middle. And since x and y satisfy the same equation with the same force, that angular momentum is zero. And so in polar coordinates, I will have um, so this is oh, uh, r dot squared plus omega zero squared over r squared is um, integral of the force. F of t, r of t, r dot of t, dt, if x double dot is f of t times x, now I allow f, f to be more interesting, y double dot equals f of t, y, and x y dot minus y x dot is omega zero. So um, from this equation, if you've ever worked out uh, Newton's equations for, in a physics class, 
Um, you've seen this before. The reason bodies don't fall into the sun is because this omega squared over r squared term is strong enough, it has such problems as r goes to zero, that unless the force is very, very strong, uh, you can't drive something into the sun. Um, so if we had, for example, instead of an inverse square force law for gravitation, if it was an inverse cube law, things would change. Um, so as long as the, the principle is, as long as that is relatively mild, um, omega zero being non-zero, it will prevent R from going to zero. So, um, this is my general setup. T equals f of t x of t y double dot of t y of t and so there. As I said, the principle is um, the only way the particle can reach the origin is if its angular momentum is zero. So you might as well assume that, for example, um, y is zero. So you can assume y is zero, and then just x is non-zero, and you'll just be watching along one axis. Um, so I just analyzed one of these equations at a time. Uh, here's some basic facts. Uh, so we're going to assume f t is less than or equal to some constant um, for all time. So uh, one of them is x dot over x. Is bound above well, T. Do that to save some space. And secondly, if X dot over X is sufficiently negative, then X of T approaches zero in some finite time. Okay, and both of these are. Um, I never know how many people are familiar with some of these basic differential equations tricks. Uh, to some of you, these are completely obvious. Maybe you haven't seen it before. If you haven't seen it before, how it goes is you write the Riccati equation uh, so this is equal to x double dot over x minus x dot squared x squared, which is less than or equal to squared minus x dot squared over x squared. So now you get a, uh, an equation for x dot over x, which is u dot less than or equal to m squared minus u squared. So if u is larger than m, then it must start decreasing. If u is smaller than m, then uh, this keeps it, this makes it turn around once it reaches m. So u is either smaller than its initial value or m, one way or the other, it's bounded above. Secondly, um, by comparison with uh, the equation version of this, if u is sufficiently negative, then it looks basically like a um, the reciprocal of the so the hyperbolic cotangent, I think, which uh, has a, a singularity at some time. Um, so this equation basically proves both of these facts. And we're going to come back to them at the very, very end of the talk. Um, for now, I want to so now I'll get a little more advanced. Uh, in general, which several people have already um, discussed, uh, some of the basic stuff. Uh, I'm just going to do it in the simplest case, which is um, diffeomorphisms of the circle, so everything's one dimensional um, in space. Let L be asymmetric. Not negative. Differential or pseudo differential operator. 
me, it's just a differential. I got small again. I got to remind myself to get big. That's pseudo differential in tiny quants. Operator um, on vector fields and circle. And lambda be some real number. And you see undependent vector field. Your well, Lagrangian equation is mt plus um theta plus lambda u theta m equals zero, where m is l of u. Um, so essentially, I'm allowing this parameter lambda. Most people wouldn't uh, or wouldn't call this Euler Arnold equation unless lambda is two. If lambda equals two, Genuine for the equation. Um, but for a lot of what I'm going to talk about, uh, it kind of works the same no matter what lambda is. And for some of the applications, um, it's worth doing a different, uh, different value. So, see how fast I'm going. So what's special about Euler Arnold equations, as we know from the very first talk, uh, is that they represent geodesics on diffeomorphism groups with a right invariant metric. And if you allow for geodesics uh, for connections that are not Riemannian, then you can get more general sorts of equations. And that's what having lambda just disappeared. I wanted to erase this. Slightly nervous. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm just trying to remember to save this, but I will. Yeah, you should write it again, and I will ask you a question. Uh, is it your lambda? Uh, is it um, the same as the equation on the territory group? So. No. No. Okay. So it's not like your. Um, no, it's not coming from an extension. It's, uh, it's essentially just coming from. So I'll erase this. Too. So basically, the the case most people would care about is lambda equals two, um, and I'm going to show you a quick computation to demonstrate that. That's what results in conservation of the uh, energy, um, which is required for a geodesic uh, in a Riemannian metric. And so, if you allow for a different value of lambda, it's um, it's essentially. So this is not something I've done, so I'm not too familiar with it. Uh, but it's essentially um, allowing for some general. A general type of connection, but that's not a very satisfying answer. From um, Escher and Kolev, maybe um, they were studying these, these equations and the geometric structure, the covariant derivative that you build in order for this to become the geodesic equation. So, um, is it like having a potential or on the No, it's not like a potential either. So. Uh, I guess it's kind of hard to explain exactly what it is. It's um, essentially, just it's not a connection from a coming from a metric. It's exactly it's it's some connection. It's not coming from a metric. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if there's any better way of. Okay, so I wanted the equation in the corner anyway. So M is LU, um, and if essentially, so, so let's do our calculation. Uh, the metric wants to be um, the inner product of U LU theta. Um, so when I, because L is symmetric, this is two times 
U L U T Big Theta and this is um, M T. So I plug in this equation, I get minus two uh, U U M theta plus lambda D theta M D theta. And so if I integrate this by parts, because it's periodic, um, this ends up being two times two minus lambda integral S one uh, U U theta M D theta. So if you want this to be zero, you must choose lambda equals two. That's essentially why um, these would not represent uh, uh, Riemannian geodesics unless lambda equals two. So um, there with the flow equation. Which in one dimension, theta t of t and theta. Uh, so here I have some initial condition given u of zero equals u zero. A to t of t and theta is u of t and theta. Of t and theta. This describes geodesics, uh, the bread invariants. Remaining metric. Which is uh, at the identity, this integral um, so once you I said that L should be uh, non negative, but I allowed it to be zero. That's because I do want to capture more examples with this, although strictly speaking, obviously it would not be a Riemannian metric in that case, um, but you can make it work sometimes as uh, on a homogeneous space. So for, for many purposes, it's close enough. So I'll write down a couple of examples. Uh, if the second time I said it, it's possible. Uh, H D theta is my favorite, although it's not what I'm going to talk about. Well, H is the public transform. Uh, so if so, this would describe the H one half Sobolev metric uh, if L equals if if lambda equals two. Uh, the reason for that is this is essentially getting you a positive definite derivative operator. And that one derivative going on here is like half a derivative going on each factor of u. This corresponds to h one half. Probably uh, the lunch equation, or also called the modified constantine lax minda equation if lambda equals minus one. The de Gregorio equation. Which most people now agree is the best one dimensional model for three dimensional Euler equations. Um, because essentially, uh, M looks like a vorticity operator, it's a first order differential like a curl. Uh, and this describes a stretching in this at the same rate that happens for 3D Euler. Um, nobody knows the answer for global existence, even for this case, one dimension. Um, but that's really what we're going to care about. If L equals minus d theta squared, uh, you get what's called Proudman Johnson. Lambda equals two is Hunter Saxton. If L is identity minus d theta squared, lambda equals two, you get. With the same L, lambda equals three, we get what's called 
uh, not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, is it Gasparis Rochesi? Um, and finally, in my case for this talk is L equals mu minus d theta squared, m equals two, you get what's called the mu from S home. Um, and there are several others that you can come up with. Um, so, all right, so what do we care about in these equations? There are two big things. Uh, the local existence theory, so does there, given a u0, does there exist for short time a solution? Um, you can certainly do this using uh, various PD techniques like um, differentiation of norms, high sublevel norms, and that sort of thing, and that's sort of the standard approach. Um, the more geometric approach is instead of just looking at this equation by itself, you pair it with eta, and in fact, it's often easier to study eta. Um, uh, the second order equation that you get by plugging this into this. And the reason for that is uh, while this is clearly not an ODE, the equation for eta often does end up being an ODE in some nice phonic space. So that's the famous um, observation of Ebbett and Marston from 1970. They got it to work for uh, ideal fluids on the volume preserving diffeomorphism group of a higher dimensional manifold. But the same basic approach works for these one dimensional equations as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. But then the second big question is after you get local existence, do you get existence for all time of solutions? Of course, for the Euler equations, that's the big famous problem that lots of people are, are trying to understand and have been for, for decades. And so we, um, a lot of people study model equations like this to try and get some clue as to what the behavior of those equations is. So almost everyone agrees the, the, um, the global existence problem is harder, um, but the theorem in 1998, uh, and it's one of my favorite theorems, it says the solution of Kamasa Holm, which is this version, Solution of Kamasa Holm exists for all time. If and only if uh, M0 never changes sign. So M0 is L of U0. So the initial momentum function, whatever it is, if it's always positive or always negative, then the solution exists for all time, um, which is certainly possible when you're considering u minus u theta theta. If you have add a big constant to u, you can make whatever you have gives you global existence. And if it changes sign, then it must break down in finite time. So trying to understand that theorem is what motivated all of what I'm going to do. Um, all right, so let's see. switch then erase. So another interesting thing about these equations, one reason people study these is because they're models of Euler. Another reason people study them is just because by themselves they're interesting because they are integrable. Um, so they're completely integrable in the sense of having infinitely many conservation laws and having a bi-Hamiltonian structure. Um, but there are different definitions of integrable. Uh, and in fact, in this paper of McKean, I read, so he quoted Flaschka in saying, the only honest definition of integrability is, you didn't think I could integrate that, but I can. Which is why I never actually bothered to learn the correct definition of integrability, because that seemed good enough to me. But these are integrable. I'm not gonna use the structure of, um, of those infinitely many conservation laws and the, the lax pair. Um, you probably could. But, uh, but what I'm, I'm going to do relies on just two conservation laws. I apologize to those of you who I told that joke to last night. You heard it twice. 
Uh, okay, so um, let's get started with. So from now on, everything I'm going to talk about is the new dimensional home equation, which is the case lambda equals two and mt plus u m theta plus two u theta m equals zero. Uh, Oh, there's one other thing I wanted to say about this in general. I can, so looking at this equation, I can rewrite it as, it's not a great place for it. So over here, actually, it's, it's so important, I'll put it over here and keep it up there. So um, if I differentiate the flow equation, eta t theta becomes uh, u theta composed with eta, times data there. Um, so that's differentiating it in space and using the chain rule. Uh, and then the, um, the generalized Euler Arnold equation takes the form m of t eta of t theta times eta theta to the eta theta of t and theta raised to the power lambda. The derivative of that is equal to zero. And so if I integrate in time with my fingers, this quantity must be equal to the initial value of uh, m zero. This, like I said, is why the case lambda equals one would correspond to direct stretching of the vorticity by the diffeomorphism, which is why people think that's, that's a model for fluids. Um, but lambda could be anything, like I said, lambda will be two. Uh, one thing you notice about this is the sign of, of the momentum is conserved, right? So you, this is supposed to be positive. So if the momentum is initially positive in some region, that will get stretched by eta, but it'll still be positive on that same region, same as if it's negative somewhere. Uh, okay, so that's finished. Now I'm going to let me skip some of this derivation. I'm going to say sigma is the mean. And m is sigma minus uh, u theta theta. Now, if I integrate, uh, all right, so let's write out what the equation looks like. I'm going to skip some of the details because I know you're not in the mood for that at 5 p.m. on Thursday. Um, although for some people, they're a lot of fun. I just find all the ones I meet, they're not. Um, t u theta u theta theta minus 2 sigma u theta equals 0. So that's just what this looks like explicitly. Um, and the reason there's no time derivative of sigma is you can prove one conservation law is that uh, integral from zero to one is constant in time. Uh, and the other one is integral from zero to one u theta of t theta squared theta is also constant. Well, 4k squared. Like I said, those are the only two conservation laws I need. If sigma happens to be equal to zero, then it'll always be zero and you get the hunter saxton equation, which has a nice explicit solution. So what you do is this becomes So you integrate in space and then plug in the, basically this equation for eta and replace all the u's everywhere with just things involving eta. And you get d squared dt squared of eta theta minus one half eta t theta squared of over eta theta uh, is equal to minus two k squared. 
And all right, so first of all, that's supposed to look pretty nice. Why does this look much nicer than this? Not because it's fewer derivatives, but because uh, if I'm viewing this as a function of u theta theta, like the time derivative of u theta theta, I've got derivatives of that. And derivative operators are clearly not bounded in any bonic space, which means this is certainly not an ODE. This one, however, is two time derivatives of the same function, time derivative of that same function, time der no spatial derivatives showing up here. This is precisely why it's, a, it's an ODE in bonic space. In pretty much whatever space you want. So for if I assume eta theta of each t is in C zero, for example, or any CK, or if you want, you can work in several other spaces, but you don't have to. Um, so you get local existence. We're free. Uh, and the question is how you get global existence, because of course, if you see if you see an ODE that blows up, anything that involves some quadratic thing like this is usually going to break global existence. Uh, the nice thing is I can get rid of that really quickly. The transformation I'm going to do so I switch them twice, right? So what I'm going to do is it's kind of an obvious trick. If you forget that this is actually a PDE and you just view it as um, if you view it as an ODE for a single function, you can actually even forget that this has any dependence on theta at all. And really view it as just an equation in uh, or a single function. Is where that the motivation for what we started with coming from. Not the bottom, not the bottom, not bottom, the bottom. So all I have to do so to find t theta and the square root of theta theta. And so, you know, so theta theta becomes x squared, and plug that into this equation and see what happens. And essentially, a miracle happens that everything cancels out, right? Like that's exactly what you do to kill this term. And so you get an absolutely trivial, you know, the equation that I started with, right? So you know what the solution to this is, and you can just write it down. Um, and the is it depends on. Uh, theta map. The initial condition is transformed to something involving u zero prime and sine of kt. Uh, all right. So what does that say about global existence? Clearly, the solution here exists globally in the x space. It exists globally, um, and so basically, what happens is here's zero, here's one. And we're plotting this is theta, we're plotting x of t theta. Uh, it'll start off constant at one because a is going to start at the identity. Uh, and then it'll start moving in future time. So here's time zero, time one, time two. Switch to blue. So eventually um, it goes all the way down and touches the axis. Uh, and what happens after that? It doesn't even notice and it just keeps going. So here in red, 
I'll describe a later one. Okay, so blue corresponds to breakdown of classical solutions, right? Because X has approached zero, that means eta theta approached zero. That means since eta theta approached zero, U theta must have approached, uh, right? When eta theta goes to zero, U theta must go to infinity. Because this, um, it does not hit zero at the same time. And U theta going to infinity is exactly your breakdown mechanism for the equation. So that's what X looks like. What does eta look like? And here's eta, again, same axis. Uh, so in white, it will, um, let me do eta theta first. So it'll square this, so it'll be something like the same. And then in blue, it'll also look the same in red. It'll look different. So what will happen is, um, while this solution continues for all time, uh, this one has a singularity that keeps spreading apart. So um, this thing goes to infinity at one point, then it, you could imagine it continuing as a weak solution, and what will happen is that singularity spreads, splits from one and spreads to the left and right. Uh, and so the actual velocity field, which remember is what we were originally concerned about, that's going to, uh, after the red breakdown time, so breakdown time is in blue, the red time it's going to look like, well, let me first do blue. So here's u of t theta. At the breakdown time, this vertical, this thing has a vertical tangent here. And beyond that, uh, it becomes, uh, its derivative becomes discontinuous, although the function itself remains continuous as a weak solution. Okay, so the point of all this is in the right variables, the equation does exist globally, and you reduce the problem instead of trying to prove something goes to infinity, you're trying to prove something goes to zero, which is easier. Um, all right. Okay, so remember X is still this. Well, where does this become a planar model? So define y of t theta to be minus two, x theta, t theta, plus sigma, x of t theta, integral zero to t, x to tau theta squared, p tau. Ugly looking formula. If sigma equals zero, it's a simple formula. I'm just differentiating in space. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this is because the equation that x satisfies now. So now, if in all this, I'm assuming so that's the trivial case, or not completely trivial, it was worked out by Lennels and it wasn't obvious until he did it. Um, but it's the easy case where you can see everything explicitly, which is why we love it. Um, but that's the case sigma equals zero. Now, in general, I want to consider sigma not equal to zero which is the hard case. Uh, so XTT is equal to sigma eta T minus sigma squared minus K squared X of T and theta. And I'm going to call this F of T and theta times X of T and theta. So this weird looking function Y is chosen precisely because it also satisfies the same equation. You can check that if you're bored in the next five minutes. You can just take the derivative and see what happens. Um, so, yeah, in the Hunter Saxon case, y also satisfies the minus k squared on the right hand side. And the angular momentum. So, remember the whole point of doing this is. Oh, why? So why did I introduce this? Notice in my picture here, when X approaches zero for the first time, its derivative is zero because that's where the minimum of X is, the minimum is approaching zero, right? So that means um, 
at the time when this blue curve happens, not at the red time, but at the time when the blue curve happens, uh, both x and x theta are both approaching zero. And that means y is also approaching zero because this is bounded, x goes to zero, and so y goes to zero at the same time. And that's exactly why we're talking about why would a particle approach the origin in finite time? That's exactly the breakdown mechanism here. And so why does angular momentum prevent that? So the first part of uh, the theorem is well, computation computes xyt minus yxt is, of course, by the general principle, conserved. Um, so it's some constant uh, in time function of theta. And the reason why it's chosen in this weird way is exactly so it can be the momentum theta theta squared of sigma minus u theta theta composed with eta, which is my conservation law in general for the, the momentum. Um, and so you can always do this. So, so the reason for doing this is not because I care so much about this equation, but because for any euler arnold equation, you can set it up so that you're considering um, uh, basically writing the equation for eta theta, considering it as some quasi-linear equation where maybe the force depends in a complicated way, uh, but then you can always create a second function, right, however you need to, in order to produce uh, the conserved angular momentum. And so what this tells you is, if m0 is never zero, and x of t, y of t theta, not approach zero in finite time. And that is the global existence result. Plus eta theta is positive for all time. And U exists. So U theta exists and doesn't go, stays bounded. So that's your global existence. Again, in whatever space you started with. So if you start with M0 being continuous function, it'll remain always continuous. Make sense? All right. So this is uh, just based on what I said at the very beginning, because what does this forcing function look like? It's bounded. Right? So it may be very complicated. And what's happening with each particle depends in some way on uh, all the other particles. Um, and we're just pretending that's not there. All right? Because each individual particle just sees some time dependent force and has no idea where it came from. But as long as this is bounded, um, nothing can go uh, wrong. All right. And so, last thing I will do is sketch. Okay, I should mention that this is not new, this global existence result. So this came from uh, Garrett, Michiok, Forrest, Kazin, and uh, Jonathan Lennels, uh, who actually derived this equation as a model for, um, what was it? I'm blanking on the actual reason we care about the equation. Uh, I think it was LEDs. It doesn't quite sound right. Um, but LED crystals that are that are supposed to be aligning in fluid, but also with a rotational term. So they said this equation represents roughly the equation of motion for that. Um, but they derived this and they proved that if M0 is always positive or always negative, then you have global existence. But how did they do that? Uh, basically using some functional analysis trick. And I thought to myself, like, there must be some better reason why that works, which is why I kept thinking about this. All right, so now the, the new theorem is uh, if M0 changes sign, theta 
which is here. The proof is simple enough that I can actually give it in the in here without feeling too terribly guilty. Uh, so assume without loss of generality that sigma is greater than zero. That's because if sigma was negative, you just flip um, flip the sign of the velocity field uh, and still get the same equation. Um, so you can assume that sigma is greater than zero. Now uh, m zero changes signs, so that means um, of course m zero, which is sigma minus u zero double prime. Uh, if, if sigma is positive, then of course this is zero somewhere. So m zero being positive is automatic. M zero is being negative is the interesting part. So on some interval. Uh, a to D in S1, M0 theta is less than zero. So U0 is, is less than zero, then plus uh, U0 is greater than sigma, which is positive. So essentially, we're going to be using convexity of this function in a kind of important way. So basically, the idea is use the equation ddt y of t theta over x of t theta equals m zero over x of t theta squared in three ways. What I'm going to do is I will this interval AD. I will divide up into three subintervals, um, and so what what should happen to X, which will be a strictly increasing function, is uh, well, it should look something like that. And so I'm going to establish, I don't think I'm going to actually do all this now, but the idea of the proof is, so in the first one, I take this equation, I integrate in time, I integrate in time to get an upper bound for of tc that doesn't depend on time so this can't be too high and the second part is integrate in t and and theta to get tv less than equal to e to the minus mt c for some And then finally, I integrate in theta to show x t t a over x of t a is can be made as small as I want below zero. And then I get to use this thing I've been saving. If x t over x is sufficiently negative, then x must approach zero in finite time. So this easy principle, as long as I can show that, um, that will get me my breakdown. And so I think I'll just do one of these. And then sketch. After all this, I'm looking around for an eraser. There are no erasers.
Okay, so the proof of part one, which remember, based on my formula for what y is, integrating this in time looks like I have t theta over x of t theta is the integral from zero to t and zero theta over x of tau theta squared t theta. Why? Because uh, y was equal to zero. Remember, y is minus two x theta plus x integral zero to t x squared. So when t equals zero, x is initially constant one, so y is initially zero, so there's no initial condition here. And so what that says is, well, this is certainly negative, of theta in CD, and that tells me two x theta, plugging in my formula for y, two x theta over x equals sigma integral zero to t, x squared, plus absolute value m zero, this integral, so this, and both these terms are positive, and that implies this. So x is increasing in theta. And finally, I use the fact that integral from 0 to 1, x of t theta is the integral from 0 to 1 of eta, theta. Remember, eta is a periodic diffeomorphism of the circle. That means this integrates to one. And so now I get to use the fact that x of tc squared is less than or equal to uh, integral c d x squared d theta over d minus c, which is less than or equal to one over d minus c. And that is my absolute time independent bound above for x, which is easy once you think of the trick, but uh, not entirely obvious when you get getting started. Then the second one comes from basically doing an integral inequality with this. Now I integrate it in theta. Integrate this in theta, you can already kind of see how it works, but I won't do it. And the last thing is kind of the most, is the one that depends most on this approach, which is to say x, y, t minus y, x, t. So step two, I skip step three. Remember, I have the conservation of angular momentum. If I divide everything through by x, y, and solve for x, I get x, t over x equals y, t over y plus minus m0 over x, y. And all right, so now finally, what I do is remember these two basic facts. Um, the whole point of y satisfying the exact same equation as x is that now I can use this principle. One of the things I get is that yt over y also has an absolute upper bound. So it's kind of clear for x, but not so obvious for y. But this is bounded above by a constant, whereas this, since x is getting small um, and y is the derivative of x, you can also show it's getting small, basically. Um, xt over x, this is some constant over a very small number, and that's how you make this large and negative, and then you're done. And you use the second principle, and that's your blow. So this is one above. It's now a small, and that's constant. So that's that's basically it. You can see how if you can handle this denominator, you could do this for a variety of PDEs, depending on how. In each case, y is related to x. Um, so that's in the paper. I do this for also more general values of lambda, but I won't talk about that. I will just stop here. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Are there any online questions first? Yes, there are. So, yeah, go okay. ahead or not. <laughs> I don't see any questions. Okay, okay. So, are there any questions in Vienna? No. So, let's thank Stephen again. Oh, there are. <laughs>
So what you're mostly interested in, interested in sorry, is it the eta which describes, I don't know, some, some, so eta lives on the diffeomorphism group of S1, right? Yeah. And then you mentioned to the uh, yeah. So is it the eta or is it the, the U which lives in the, the vector field on S1? Or, yeah, what, what is, I mean, in principle, what, did, what, what is the object that is most interesting for, for you, for instance? Okay, yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Um, so, so the because I look at this geometrically, because I look at this geometrically, I, and I think the diffeomorphism group is the more fundamental thing because that's where things become an ODE. I'm more interested in the behavior there. Now, what happens? Um, so, I didn't quite show this in my pictures of what breakdown looks like, but you saw eta theta dip down to the zero and then came back up and dip down again. And what that essentially corresponds to is um, eta remains smooth as a function of, of time and space. If you don't demand that it be a diffeomorphism, it's perfectly fine. And, and what happens is when the derivative goes to zero, it's essentially you know, just, just flattening out. Um, but for generic initial data, it will continue to be a homeomorphism. So you can view it as essentially when this breakdown happens, it hits the boundary of the group of diffeomorphisms, ends up being a homeomorphism still, and then maybe eventually comes back. Right? Like in the for the Hunter Saxton equation, where it's just a circle, it eventually goes all the way around and comes back where it started. Um, so that's how I view it the diffeomorphism group having a, a sort of rough boundary. This thing hits the boundary, selects along, and then comes back. Um, in, in terms of you, it looks much worse, but typically people in PDE are more concerned with that velocity field and that behavior. And if they try to, so they don't consider it having a solution beyond that, except in a weak sense. But in the in the geometric sense, you can consider the solution existing for all time um, without any problem. Okay. Are there any more questions? Okay. I have one more question, if I may. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, like in considering, um, if you think this uh, as a PDE, an ODE on the different morphism group, then you uh, you would say that kind of like. Uh, flows always exist for all times because you can just like left translate it and then use the local existence uh, theorem again. So um, why would kind of like what is your in, like the interpretation in terms of like these blow up uh, phenomena? Uh, like what is going wrong with this naive picture in finite dimensions uh, if you translate it to the um, different morphism group? That's a very good question. So what happens is um, in finite dimensions the the Lie group topology is generated by the Riemannian metric. Right? And so a ball um, where you have local existence can be right translated and it still remains a ball of that same size. What happens here is my Riemannian metric is, uh, like in this case, it's H1, sobel of H1. Um, the topology of the diffeomorphism group has to be at least C1, and H1 is not enough. And so it's that gap between the Riemannian metric topology and the local existence topology where this actually is an ODE because it's not in H1. Uh, where this is an ODE, um, those are different. And so the ball that you're imagining you have local existence in, when you apply the right translation, that's an isometry in the Riemannian metric, but it's not in the C1 or H2 or whatever topology you actually need to work with. So that ball gets um, shrunken as you go. And that is the crucial problem with uh, just getting automatic global existence for all geometric ODEs in different dimensions. Like gap in the topology. Okay, makes sense. Thanks. So, are there any more questions? If not, let's thank Stephen again.